today is assessment, sound assessment practices or assessment to promote mathematics learning. And um, parts of this will be me talking and parts of this will be you engaging. So I hope we have a good morning. So as an overview of the presentation, I, I always find it kind of is helpful to start off with just kind of groundwork in terms of purposes of assessment. And then I want to move to classroom assessment. Um, a little bit about large-scale assessment. I mean, for the most part this morning, we're talking about sound assessment practices in a classroom. Then a little bit um, in some recent research to share with you around the interplay between classroom and large-scale assessment. And we'll finish up today by talking about how we support sound assessment practices um, for uh, our classrooms. So in doing this presentation, I'm drawing on some very recent work. And um, the recent work is, uh, one, one thing is this book that was recently published in April 2015. And it's an edited book, uh, so it has a variety of chapters. And I was one of the editors. And um, what that means is when you're an editor, it doesn't just mean you're kind of checking their spelling. It really is about conceptualizing the book, putting out a call to ask researchers to submit chapters, um, setting up your editorial panel. And you can see the editorial panel. We have a teacher, Ann Arden, actually, from Ottawa. And we also have researchers from a variety of different universities who have particular expertise in assessment, including Dylan William, which might be a bit of a familiar name if you've read any research in formative assessment. He's sort of a guru of formative assessment. You've probably heard of Black and William referred to. And so people submit these chapters, and then from that, we read and review them. And um, out of the 57 chapters that were submitted, 22 will get sort of revisions and final edits. And we're then organized into the categories of assessment in action, which is a se section which has chapters that talk about um, sound assessment practices in classrooms, another section that has chapters that talk about the design of assessment tools and strategies, another section that um, submits research around uh, professional learning practices <clears throat> to support teachers in assessment, and then a final <clears throat> Excuse me. A final one, assessment as evidence, which tends to look at some big issues around assessment, such as uh, interpreting assessment data, um, relationships between large scale and classroom assessment. So I'll direct you to that because I'm going to, um, at times, be referring to particular chapters from that book since it is fairly current research. I'm also drawing a bit on principles to action, which I know many of you um, might be familiar with. I see that in some particular um, school boards. This has been part of a book study. And um, it's also been, um, it's fairly accessible. It's from the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. But what's handy is it can be downloaded as a PDF, for, and it's fairly inexpensive. Um, and I happen to be writing right now. They're, they're going to be putting out a research companion to this Principles to Action to kind of talk about what's the research behind what's in that book. And I've just finished the chapter on the research in assessment for that research companion. So I'm drawing on some of that work as well. And probably uh, some of you are familiar with the, the recent monograph, Making Space for Students to Think Mathematically, which came out in February, which um, is pretty, I think, practitioner friendly and uh, has a problem in it that actually can be used at a variety of different grade levels. And the focus on this is how do we actually um, sort of facilitate rich tasks. And the focus is really on questioning. Um, and so the questioning, um, I see here in the chat pod that we're having trouble with um, the sound is muffled. I'm hoping that it's getting better and that not everybody's having that issue. Um, so anyway, uh, the focus on this is also on questioning. So that might be something that you want to, um, to have a look at. So I'll be drawing on some of those things as I talk. The first thing I want to share with you, and I'm not reading through this in great detail, but I'll direct your attention to this, is that within that NCTM document, Principles to Action, um, it talks about a variety of different things. The book is not just about assessment. Um, it talks about um, rich tasks. It talks about professional learning. It talks about professionalism in mathematics teaching. Um, 
And so for each of these topics that are in there, there's always a one pager that talks about beliefs about that particular aspect. And it talks about sort of a movement from unproductive beliefs to productive beliefs. And this happens to be the page that talks about assessment in that book. It's a handy book. I'm not trying to sell it, but it is a handy book because it's the kind of thing that one can pick up, look at a couple of pages and get something out of. It's not, I know teachers are busy, principals are busy, and you don't always have time to sit down and read, read a whole book. Um, so this is the page that talks about some of the productive beliefs around assessment. And um, for many of these, I'm going to go into it in more detail when I talk about um, particularly classroom assessment. So I'll be talking about things like what does it mean to be embedded in instruction? What does it mean to assess mathematical understanding and processes and the need for a variety of tasks? So as I mentioned, many of the things that are in here are actually things that I'll talk about in much more detail. Okay. So let's just start off with the purposes of assessment. And um, Many of you, I suspect, know some of these things, but I, I just wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page. So we know that the Ontario curriculum says that the purpose of assessment is to improve student learning. And that's not just an Ontario thing. That is, if we look at any of the research or current perspectives in assessment, um, we know that everybody's talking about that. And I put another quote there. Assessment reform affirms that while assessment may be conducted for many reasons and has multiple purposes, um, that really the central purpose should be to support and enhance student learning. And I think that we need to keep that in mind um, all of the time when we consider the task of assessment. And we know the differences between formative and summative assessment. And we know that formative assessment tends to be more ongoing, that we're actually um, gathering evidence. Sometimes it's a bit impromptu. Sometimes it's very planned to be able to provide feedback to both teacher and, and student. And that um, this can take a variety of different forms. It could be a quiz where we provide descriptive feedback. It could even be um, the way we question and listen and respond to student thinking. And summative assessment um, is more a matter of looking at a student's learning up to a particular point in time. So it could perhaps be um, gathering evidence and putting that together to be able to provide a report card marker. We could be talking about sort of a final exam or a test at the end of the unit. Or sometimes summative assessment could be done by a portfolio assessment where we've gathered evidence of student learning over time. It's collected in this portfolio. And we then are looking at that, taking all of that into account. And we're able to then uh, come up with where is the student at this particular point, or at least an approximation of that. We know that there is currently a lot of emphasis on formative assessment because the research tells us, and um, I'm referring here to the Black and William that I spoke about before. I know that's 1998, but there's been uh, even since 1998 when Black and William did a review of all the research on formative assessment. Since then, there have been many other studies on formative assessment to say similar things. That we know that formative assessment makes significant change in student achievement most notably for struggling learners, so most notably for low achievers. That if we are raising uh, the achievement of all students in particular, we see a big difference in terms of, of students who are struggling. We know that formative assessment, and you know, there's, there's a big discussion about what is formative assessment. Um, I know quite often in the US, they've been having um, a lot of sort of uh, publishing companies come up with uh, computer-assisted formative assessments, be, and they're leaning on the research that says formative assessment is good. But I think we need to think about what really is formative assessment. That it really is an interaction with the teacher, the student, and the mathematics. It really pays attention to detail. What is it that students know? What is it they can do? What might be the next steps? What are their understandings? What are their misconceptions? Also, what experiences do they have that we can connect their current learning to? So it's a matter of looking at their prior learning as well and being able to think about next steps. 
Um, I'm sharing some data uh, with you that is um, Ontario teachers. And sometimes I'm leaning on some examples that might be elementary, but I think they have value for secondary. Sometimes I'm leaning on some examples that are more secondary, but I've chosen them because I think that they also have value for elementary teachers. So um, please don't kind of tune out those that might be a different division than what you're in. So this is survey data from take, it taken from over a thousand Ontario teachers, and there's no doubt about it, it was a few years ago, but I still think it has some relevance. We did a survey around the implementation of the intermediate curriculum, and we looked at a variety of things, such as what are teachers' practices, not just in assessment, but in instruction, what's their use of technology, manipulatives, what's their understanding of curriculum, just to get a sense of, so what's happening out there? You know, one puts out a new curriculum, and that doesn't necessarily mean that it's implemented and taken up in the same way by everybody. So two of the questions that we asked were, um, <clears throat> were these two questions. What do you use to get a sense of students' understanding of mathematics? And what do you use to determine a report card mark? And what we wanted to do is look at a variety of things. At that time, we see that there were grade 7 to 10, a lot of paper and pencil tests and quizzes. We even looked at this data by grade, and you would imagine that there might be uh, some differences as well between grade 7, 8 teachers and 9, 10. But I'm sharing this data to focus on the part that's highlighted, because we noticed that there was a difference between what teachers use to get a sense of understanding and what they use to come up with a report card mark. Um, and there are many comments we could make, like, why are we using homework to come up with a report card mark? But we'll leave that alone. What we did notice was that there were differences. So there are some particular things that teachers are using as formative assessment practices, in other words, to get a sense of students' understanding, which might not be used as heavily as a report card mark. We only took this data to, to say, you know what, I think that teachers are using some things for formative assessment and not everything is being used just in terms of coming up with a report card mark. Um, might be interesting to collect this sort of data again and sort of see whether there are any shifts. Now, I talk about formative and summative assessment, but I think something that's important to kind of put out there is it's not actually the assessment itself that is formative or summative. It really is about how is it that we use the evidence from that assessment that makes it formative or summative. And I think that's kind of an important distinction. So in other words, one could be using a, a particular a portfolio, let's say, as a summative assessment, or one could be using it as a formative assessment. To tell you the truth, I actually think it could serve as both. Um, and sometimes we have summative assessments, let's say an end of unit test, or let's say an EQAO assessment. But then later, if we're using the results of that assessment, which is summative, to help to inform our upcoming instruction, in a sense, we're using the summative assessment as formative. So really, when we talk about those two terms, we have to think about them in terms of what is it that we use that, that, uh, those results for. So now I'm going to focus on classroom assessment. And uh, you've been listening for a while, so soon I want to be able to get into some areas where you can participate and contribute. Um, so a couple of principles of sound classroom assessment, which I've got here as a bulleted list, but I'm actually going to go into much more detail for each of them. So we know it should be ongoing and embedded instruction. <clears throat> we know we should use a variety of assessment strategies, and we'll talk about why. Um, assessment should be aligned with curriculum and instruction. Um, so in other words, if students are using technology in their um, instruction, then they should have access to that in their assessment. Um, and that assessment task should mirror instructional tasks. Um, it should focus on meaningful mathematics. And um, it's important to talk about what that actually means. Uh, it should be used to improve teaching and learning. And it should include students in the assessment process. So I'm going to go into detail for each of those. First of all, the ongoing and embedded in instruction. <clears throat> really, assessment should be seamless with instruction. It's actually hard for me um, to sometimes talk about assessment because it doesn't stand alone. It actually is part of just good classroom instruction. And um, But here we are. So we see it as an event. Sorry, not an event, but a process. Um, there's a lot of research now 
um, in a topic called noticing, and it's particular in mathematics. And it's about noticing student thinking. And for me, the work on noticing um, is really closely tied to formative assessment because it really is about teachers paying attention to student thinking, recognizing that student thinking, and being able to act on that student thinking. And so I, I see that as occurring constantly in, in classroom instruction. And it's about not just noticing that thinking, but how to set that up. So what kinds of questions do we ask? What are the ways that we listen so that we're really listening to hear student thinking? Um, as well as um, responding to that student thinking in appropriate ways. These are not easy tasks. They can be quite difficult tasks um, because quite often teachers are tasked with noticing a variety of things, not just student thinking as they proceed. <clears throat> Um, one thing that, um, that I wanted to bring up is maybe many of you are familiar with the book, uh, The Five Practices, because I know some boards have used it for a book study. And one of the chapters that's actually in that assessment book that I talked about <clears throat> is written by one of the authors, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the authors of The Five Practices, um, Peg Smith, as well of, as her colleague, Ed, Ed Silver. And what they talked about in this chapter is that actually looking at the five practices of anticipating student responses before you give them a task, monitoring as students work, selecting and sequencing um, <clears throat> solutions that then should be shared with the whole class, and connecting those mathematical ideas, that work is really actually closely tied to the notion of integrating formative assessment in one's teaching, because you're paying attention to that student thinking and acting on it. So um, that might be something that I'll direct you to. You might be interested in this book, Five Practices for Orchestrating Productive Mathematics Discussions, um, <clears throat> and the follow-up chapter um, that talks about how this is closely related to formative assessment. So another aspect is that sound classroom assessment uses a variety of assessment forms. And you've been listening for quite some time, and you probably don't need me to talk about what that variety looks like. So I'm going to give you a couple of minutes. If you're working with other people and you're in a bit of a group, you might want to have a discussion about what are some assessments that you have observed being used in mathematics teaching and learning in the classroom. Um, and uh, then type those into the chat pod. We'll give you a couple of minutes. If you're working on your own, then maybe uh, just come up with some that you've seen and type those in. Uh, we'll give you a couple of minutes to type a few things in, and then I'll just kind of reflect on some of the things that you're talking about.
So we'll give you that an, another minute or so to finish typing in uh, what you've been discussing. We've got a wide array, and I'll talk about some of these things that you've typed in. Chris, if you could go to the uh, volume slider by the microphone and just slide it down a little bit and just give me an audio sample. Let me see if that takes away the distortion. Um, tell me where that is again. Adjust it's microphone. Top, it's the top left of your screen. Yeah, adjust microphone. There you go. Is that better? Better. Thank you very much. Not a problem. OK, so boy, you have tons of ideas here. We'll just let uh, the last person finish typing. So some of the things that I've seen you type in are placemats, explain everything, which is an app you can get for the iPad where the students actually solve the problem. The iPad becomes a whiteboard. And it also is an audio recorder. And it records the video of what they're jotting down. Uh, so then you can play that back. Um, we see problem solving questions, conferencing, Congress, um, video recording of students thinking, um, rubrics, unit tests, math journals, portfolios, peer work, exit cards, observations, um, performance tasks, um, number talks, so many different things. Um, so it's great. It sounds as though there are many great things that are happening out there in schools and I want to be able to talk about so why are we using this variety of different kinds of assessments? Um, but there are many things here. And what's nice about having this kind of conference is people can see what everybody else is doing. And you might end up having a question about what does that really look like? So make a note as to who's typing that in so that you can follow them up. Um, and there was a discussion happening at one of the, uh, oh, Ben, you're typing that in. Um, around practices not necessarily being used to come up with an overall report card mark that often tests are being relied on for that. And <clears throat> we're actually going to be talking uh, a little bit later this morning about um, what an assessment plan might look like overall. And I'm going to share with you um, one particular teacher that I've worked with and how she um, uses the data to come up with report card marks. So I think that will help to answer some of those questions. So it's so great to see all of these things that people are using or that they've been seeing within their schools. Um, terrific. OK, I'm going to carry on. Um, and why do we use a variety of assessment strategies? Um, so a couple of different reasons. I'll just give a couple. Um, we know that students actually demonstrate their learning in different kinds of ways. Um, so students. Some students um, are great at orally explaining their thinking and don't want to write anything down. Others might be fine with writing work down, but they don't necessarily want to demonstrate it another way. We also provide multiple opportunities to show what they know and can do, which is slightly different than the first. So in other words, um, at a particular point in time, they might actually not be ready to demonstrate their understanding or their learning, but at another point in time, they would. And it also takes into account the complex processes of doing mathematics. So I'm going to, a little bit later on, look at so what is the curriculum asking of us. And if we actually look at the actions of mathematics, I actually can't assess the actions of mathematics with a paper and pencil test alone. If I look at the verbs in the curriculum, it just doesn't work. Um, and in fact, when I look at particular expectations, they tend to lean themselves lean uh, towards particular types of assessment. So we'll look at that in a little while. This idea of observation. Um, observation is really important. And we know in particular that it's really important in the primary grades, that we know quite often that the student's mathematical thinking is beyond what they actually can write about. And so if we use observation and we use conferencing with them, then we know that it's, it's really important. Um, we'll get a sense of their understanding. Um, and um, also, sometimes we use artifacts or materials with students to help them explain their thinking. But observation is not just for um, early learners. 
Um, I often use the example uh, when I was teaching in the classroom um, that uh, I had a grade nine applied student who, um, who was working on a particular task that took a couple of days. And when it actually came time to hand it in, he didn't have it with him anymore. He said, oh, I lost it. Don't worry about it, miss. Just, just give me a zero on it. And wow, did that hit me as a secondary teacher, the importance of observation, because I actually watched him achieve the curriculum expectations the task was designed to assess. And the written evidence wasn't actually really necessary. And quite often with uh, students who might be struggling learners, they can often be reluctant to hand in written work. And um, I think it's important that we find other ways to capture their understanding, uh, which could be through observation or through conversation. So um, I highlight that idea. We also know that sound classroom assessment has to be aligned with curriculum instruction and focus on meaningful mathematics. Um, as I said before, math activity is complex and it, you can possibly assess it with just one form of assessment. Um, and we also need to consider that when students are, or when the curriculum calls that students work with a variety of different tools and strategies, or that students work on an investigation, or if students are expected to demonstrate their learning in different kinds of ways, then we need to give them those opportunities, um, not just with instructional activities, but with assessment activities. Um, we know that sometimes some of the simple parts of mathematics, some computational skills, are quite easy to assess. But it's really important that we don't just assess those things that are easy to assess. Because assessment shows students what we value. If we say we value problem solving and we value multiple ways they look at a problem, and then if we're giving assessments that are focused on other sets of skills than the ones we say we value, then those students um, won't really believe what we say. I, I always say, put your money where your mouth is. If those are the things you actually say you value, then those are the components that need to be in our assessment because the students will see what it is you value through that. So just some samples of some of those verbs I was talking about, representing, solving, comparing, drawing diagrams, investigating, collecting data, describing, creating tables, explaining, graphing. These are not words that I made up. They're just words that had come. They're verbs that had come from the curriculum. And some of you who have done that verb activity with me in some workshops know that there are many, many, many more. Not only that, but there are those mathematical processes. And so we need to reflect all of these things within our assessment. So if the expectations are calling for students to collect data or explain their thinking, then our assessment strategies need to think of ways that we can actually assess um, the degree to which students are able to collect data, uh, investigate, or describe, or compare, or do some uh, computational tasks like add and subtract, as well as reflecting these mathematical processes. So for instance, if this were an expectation, uh, students will create and analyze designs involving translations, reflections, dilatations, and or simple rotations of two-dimensional shapes using a variety of tools and strategies. This is taken from grade seven. Maybe I could ask you to talk in your group about what might assessment look like. And this is a specific expectation. I know we're not always assessing specific expectations, but for our purposes, it's easier to just look at this. What might assessment look like that is addressing this expectation? So I'll give you a couple of minutes to chat in your group and then throw some ideas in the chat pod uh, in order to talk about what might assessment of this look like.
there's lots of good ideas coming out there. I'll give you a couple of minutes to type a few things in. I've taken down some notes so that I can talk about it. It's funny, I noticed the thing about the Islamic um, tiling patterns. Um, I actually just returned from a conference in uh, in Italy on innovative math education. And somebody uh, presented work on Islamic art and geometry. And she actually wasn't somebody um, who was a mathematician. She actually was involved in um, Islamic textiles and um, was curator of an art studio. So it was really quite interesting. Great, lots of good ideas. Okay, let me make a couple of comments. So you had all kinds of ideas. Um, you're familiar with tessellations and you talked about creating tessellation art, connecting with art. Um, and many of you talked about, um, not just about creating the art, but also um, addressing the issue of analyzing those designs. So in other words, um, being able to describe the transformations being able to analyze the work of others. Some of you suggested explain everything so that the students are talking about what are the rotations that they used. And that's also that notion of getting at that meaningful math. So it's not just about creating the design, but it's also about using math language to be able to talk about what are the transformations that they used in order to be able to um, to create that design. So they might create the design and then talk about how they used a reflection um, or perhaps they used uh, some simple rotation and what angle they rotated it through um, so that we make sure that as we're doing the assessment, we're paying attention to those particular verbs. So we're seeing students not only create but also do some analysis of the design and to be able to talk about the strategies that they used and the transformations that they used. Um, and a lot of you um, are suggesting different kinds of technology where they could use that. So geometer sketchpad um, or um, oral assessment or using the iPad with explain everything or other iPad apps that you've talked about. Um, so I think that we're getting in the idea uh, as to getting at the heart of um, the particular verbs that are in there. Obviously, this one wouldn't suit itself too well to, to a, test, uh, a test question. Um, okay, let's move on. So this is another expectation that I wanted us to look at. It says, estimate and calculate the area of composite two-dimensional shapes by decomposing into shapes with known area relationships. And I want to actually look at a task, and I'm drawing on um, somebody else's research here. Um, these uh, people, uh, Patricia Hunsatter and Denise Thompson, do a lot of work around looking at a task that they might find as a published task and then adapting that task um, to more clearly address uh, mathematical processes. And so what I want us to do is to consider this particular task and to think about how might we adapt this task to be able to incorporate some of the mathematical processes. So what I'm asking you to do is to take a couple of minutes and think about how would you change this um, so that we're addressing, let's say, at least one of those particular um, process uh, expectations or mathematical processes. So we'll give you a minute to work on that um, and just throw some ideas there as to how you might change it. It could be changing the wording. What wording might you put onto that um, so that you modify the task to make it richer? And you might even want to, um, 
to type in what um, what process or processes you feel you're adapting it to more clearly address. Yep, the way Kathleen is reading my mind. couple of ideas of people adding in a context. It's a shaded lawn. How much sod do you need? Contractor problem. Um, asking students to explain their thinking or using manipulatives. Asking them about the tools that they might use. Show their answer in more than one way. Having a question a bit more open, some of you are talking about not including the numbers so that they have to explain their thinking. And I apologize, the task is taken from the US. That's why it has feet in it. Oh, how the contractor would need to explain their quote as how they came up with it. Some of you are getting out the idea of communicating, connecting it to a real world context. Some of you are talking about selecting tools and strategies with the idea of using manipulatives. <laughs> it's interesting. Lots of you are looking, a couple of you are looking at the white space there as opposed to the black, the shaded in area. Whether the white area and this gray area are the same. That's kind of cool. You could kind of ask them how to adjust the pattern so that the white area and the gray area are the same. Again, tools being used, Senta cubes. Oh, wow. Design another shape with the same area. It's a good problem solving question. Or maybe justifying so we can get it reasoning and proving. Yeah, giving them a total area and having them come up with dimensions of something. Engage in deliberation. So I'm assuming, Mike, we're talking about having them like consult with one another. Maybe you can explain that a little bit more. So I'm moving from just finding the area to then coming up with an application. Yeah, so they could come up with the scenario as opposed to us even giving them a scenario as to where one might need to use this. Mm, I like this, moving it from 2D to 3D. So I'm hoping I'm giving you enough time to have those conversations if you're working in a group. We'll take a couple more minutes. But if you feel as though I'm rushing you when you're working in a group, then maybe uh, give me that message. Mm -hmm. How might you solve, take away all the dimensions, give an area amount, and let the students find the possibilities? I kind of like that. It's open a new question where they actually have to design it. Um, again, we're trying to get at composite shapes, but I think that would get to that as well. Okay, another minute or so. And remember, if you feel I'm not giving you enough time, then uh, just 
give me that message. It's hard to facilitate discussion when you don't see people. Okay, you all had some great ideas um, in terms of how you might adapt this. And I actually think that this is not, not a bad um, activity to, to do as a group of teachers together um, as a professional learning activity is to find some particular tasks and then to think about how could we take this task and make it a bit richer to be able to brainstorm ways. Sometimes um, people have trouble finding rich tasks, but I find sometimes you can, you can get uh, a task that is not rich and think about how can we flip this? How can we brainstorm this? Uh, into maybe getting at more of these processes, um, but also to make sure we're addressing some of the expectations that we were hoping to use and thinking about how to change the language. I'm going to share with you just one modification that actually the authors in this paper came up with. I think you had many other um, suggestions that I think were, were maybe even a bit richer than this one. So the modification that they happened to suggest was Sabrina wants to replace her kitchen counters, which is the shaded area, with mosaic tiles sold in one foot square sheets. How many tile sheets will we need? And use the diagram to show how you know that your answer is correct. So in this particular modification, um, she's doing what some of you suggested, which is to give a particular context. I also see that they might be suggesting that we're using some sort of um, tools. We might think about having this as a diagram, and some of you suggested using some manipulatives. So you might use, let's say, those little square plastic tiles to think about those as one foot square sheets. Um, and uh, so they're coming up with tiling it. And then maybe we could add to that. Some of you suggested find your answer in a couple of different ways. So. Um, <clears throat> you had many other ideas, I think, that were, as I said, probably a bit richer for doing this. But I think the idea of modifying a task um, to better address the meaningful mathematics and the processes, I think, could be a useful activity to do. OK, so as we're thinking about um, assessment, we need to be thinking about um, can a mathematical activity adequately be assessed using a simple to score test? And I think that we know the answer is no. And I notice in your conference chat, trying to pay attention to lots of different things going on, some of you were talking about um, EQAO and its impact on teachers. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later as well. But it's, it nicely comes up here. EQAO clearly states um, in its frameworks for its assessments that while the EQAO assessment um, addresses the Ontario curriculum. So what that means is that I could actually look at a question on EQAO and I could find its match to a curriculum expectation. It also clearly says that due to the nature, the fact that it's a paper pencil test, it cannot assess all of the curriculum expectations, particularly those that deal with things like problem solving and investigation. So I think that sometimes that's important to point out because um, we actually know that students develop their conceptual understanding through um, those um, activities where they are investigating and communicating and they're having rich tasks. And so it's important that we're actually doing that to enhance students' understanding. And I think we have to be fairly careful about just letting the, uh, the questions on EQAO guide the work that we do in the classroom because um, well some people might feel that's preparing them for the assessment and I suggest it's actually not that we're actually deepening students understanding um, by addressing the full range of curriculum expectations and we know that working on uh, the mathematical processes is, is really what's going to enhance their understanding and so we have to consider too when we're looking at assessments whether um, we're just choosing assessments that are easy to mark, um, easy to provide a score on, or are these assessments actually representing the meaningful mathematics and the mathematics that we think that it's important for students to learn and reflecting the way that students learn that mathematics. And that, again, goes back to that match between curriculum assessment and instruction to make sure that those are fully aligned. Um, as well as thinking about the continuum. So in other words, um, are we actually assessing 
sort of what makes this expectation at this grade different from the grade that came before? Are we actually getting at the difference um, so that we are actually assessing what's most appropriate for them to be doing in this particular grade or course. Um, <clears throat> so again, it's even going back to that idea of those, um, the, the question with the tessellations and the Escher art. It's not just the assessment of doing the art and creating the pattern. It's also the assessment of sort of some of the important mathematical parts, which is that analysis and the description of their design using the mathematical language. Oh, I'm still working on those. What are some components of sound classroom assessment? We know that it's used to improve teaching and learning. We know that student responses should inform teachers of the next steps for the class or for individual students. And that feedback from peers and teachers should also inform students of their understandings and their next steps. I think it's also important to recognize that when we're providing feedback to students, that it's important to talk to them about what kinds of things you notice that they know not just about what kinds of things they still need to learn or what kinds of things they don't know. I often emphasize when I'm working uh, with people and we're looking at videos of students explaining their thinking, that sometimes people want to jump to conclusions that let's say, Allison, hey, she doesn't really seem to know that three times two is six. And I tend to emphasize that quite often, all we can actually learn from an assessment is what it is students know. That's what we have evidence of. We often don't have evidence of what, <clears throat> what they don't know unless we probe their thinking a bit further. But I think we have to be fairly careful that we um, don't make assumptions about what students don't know, that it's important actually to look at what it is they do know. <clears throat> There's also research that suggests that the, the timeliness of the feedback to students is extremely important. So um, the uh, distance between the student's performance and when they receive the feedback should be as short as possible for that feedback to have the greatest effect. Um, so again, some of that happens as the assessment is embedded in instruction and um, we're able to respond to student thinking in that moment. Including students in the assessment process is a, a key feature of a sound assessment of practice. So that could be a co-construction of rubrics or the co-construction of success criteria. It could be sharing samples of student work and having them discuss the kinds of things that they're seeing in that work. Um, and it could be anonymous work. It could be work from a previous year um, and letting students have a discussion about that. It's also about, um, well, what I call self-referencing. Well, other people call it that as well. So we've moved from a culture where um, uh, quite a long time ago, we used mostly norm referencing. So we looked at bell curves. We compared one student with another. Um, so that was a, a referencing students with respect to their peers. We moved to, you know, to criterion referenced, where um, we're hoping that students can all get to level three or beyond. It's kind of like setting a target. And we're kind of, um, that's our criteria for that target. But I think sometimes we have to also think about self-referencing. In other words, not just thinking about whether all students at the end of that class, did they all meet our, that learning goal? Did they all end up there? Or think about where was that student's thinking at the beginning of the class, or the beginning of the unit, or the beginning of that term? And where is that student's thinking now? And has that thinking moved along? So what we're really doing is comparing the student to where they are now to where they were before. Um, because it can be somewhat frustrating if we're trying to get all students to hit exactly the same target. And so I think that it's important for us to think about um, individual, students as individuals. And if we're paying attention to their thinking, then we're able to see whether we've moved them along. And I think celebrating that with that student is an important thing so that they can see their growth. Um, they may be getting work back that, oh, gee, I'm still at level one. But, you know, the, the target kept moving the whole time. So actually, there's been some growth there um, and developing self-assessment and metacognition. So I wanted to share with you again one of those chapters from that book, um, because what's important about this is it's a chapter where somebody did some research on um, a professor uh, who was working with their undergraduate students in a mathematics course on the co-construction of problem-solving observation rubric. 
And I think that this is important, particularly if we have secondary people listening, because sometimes we think that, well, yeah, I might be trying this in, uh, you know, in secondary school, but when they go to university, it's going to all be different. And it's interesting because we had several people submitting research to that book who were doing research with professors at the university level and around things like co-construction or um, designing um, learning goals or working with them around their metacognition to be more aware of their own learning. So I think that that was, was sort of important. And again, involving students in the assessment process. So I'm sharing with you a sample of um, a plan of classroom assessment for a particular grade 10 student. And I must admit that actually this, um, this um, software is something that happens to be used in the Ottawa Carlton District School Board. And I think it's actually something that they designed um, themselves. And um, what this teacher has done is this teacher for this grade 10 student has um, the A1, A2, A3, A4 around the left hand side are actually um, overall expectations, curriculum expectations. Each of those little round circles <coughs> represents um, assessment data that was gathered and recorded. This teacher would also use a lot of formative assessment practices, um, which do not necessarily get recorded. So it could be feedback on quizzes, it could be observations or conversations, but these are those that are recorded. Um, the T's, like T3's, T4's, represent tests. Um, the TK's represent tasks, and the OBS's, oh, sorry, OBAs represent observations. So she has these recorded as three kinds of things. She also has, you can see, for instance, that there might be a, a, a test, let's say test three, that happens to be assessing several different curriculum expectations. So that's put in a variety of different places. <clears throat> and that this is kind of gathered all over the place. And so at the end of the term, she actually sits down with the student or she'll sit down with them throughout the term and, and let's look at this plan. And she will have a conversation with the student that might say, he might say, you know, like it really looks that um, on um, expectation A4 that um, I'm showing sort of level two and level three. And I really feel as though those particular um, assessments do not really reflect what it is I feel I know. And actually, he can negotiate to, to find another way to demonstrate his understanding. So actually do sort of a supplemental um, assessment and kind of move some of those dots to different places. So it's involving the student in the assessment process. It's making that assessment process um, in terms of coming up with a report card mark uh, transparent that the student and um, it also, the student's well aware of all of these things and what this looks like. And so they can also negotiate um, kind of having another crack at demonstrating their uh, evidence of, of the level of achievement of some of those particular expectations. So I wanted to share that to help to address things like the, um, how do we develop an assessment plan? And um, what does that look like? Um, what does it look like when we have a variety of different assessments and how do we actually incorporate the student in that assessment process? So I thought that was sort of an interesting way of looking at that. And it certainly is a nice visual that um, would create a conversation with a student or with a parent um, to be able to kind of talk through many of those things. So I see David wants to know what the report card mark is and I'm not going to answer that so I don't actually know what the teacher came up with being devil's advocate there. Um, but um, that is a good question. And the teacher can pretty uh, clearly come up with something and justify it using these marks. Um, it's quite fluent with the kinds of data that she's collected and, and where she would go. And, and actually, the student also would be pretty comfortable um, and sort of know what that might be. So I'm going to give you a minute um, to use the chat pod to talk to a couple of things that um, have a discussion amongst yourselves. And um, before we move on to looking at large scale assessment, to talk about what have you seen as some best practices 
in assessment um, and or what do you see as some of the challenges? And you could either deal with one or the other or both. And I'll give you a couple of minutes to have that discussion and type some ideas in. And also you can feel free to respond to what some people are typing in as well uh, if, you, if something resonates with you. So feel free to say something about what somebody else says, maybe just refer to them. Maybe another minute or two.
got lots of great ideas. I'm trying to jot down all these notes so that I can talk to them a bit. Okay, great. Wow. Okay, hey, another minute. A uh, couple more. Uh, I see the challenges. That list seems to be the longest. I'll let those that are groups who've had the conversation have a chance to just type in what they've been saying. Talking about. Oh boy, math presented as punishment. That kind of is <clears throat> got a knife in my heart. Huh? If you're noisy, we'll do math online. Great. Okay, well, the last couple people type in. Um, I'll just first talk maybe about some of the things that I saw uh, as best practices, many great things happening out there. So um, giving students time to make mistakes, revise. Um, um, using feedback to guide instruction, people coming up with a long-term assessment plan, um, talking about other ways to document um, student understanding, things like photographs, um, uh, a lot of work around things like um, growth mindset, as well as um, teachers using um, things like observations. And some of you are talking about things like uh, some of the difficulty, what do we do with some of the uh, observations and how do we actually use that? Um, some people having the student math talks and three-part lessons, um, using things like achievement charts to help to guide some of the assessment practices. So lots of things going on there. Um, in terms of challenges, so some of you are talking about the idea that um, of, of teacher's math content knowledge and that sometimes that's um, that's that's kind of critical when we talk about things like um, how I talked about the work on noticing. So being able to notice students' mathematical thinking and knowing which steps to take is um, is a fairly important piece that is connected to what's called a math knowledge for teaching. So in other words, developing that understanding. There's a lot of evidence that some of that understanding is developed through uh, collaborative work that teachers do. Um, through looking together at student work, through working together to anticipate student responses, um, even watching videos of student thinking and discussing them. So there are many ways that we can assist in developing um, that um, teacher's comfort with the mathematics so that they can provide uh, some of the, the response and be able to recognize the mathematics. So, um, But that is kind of a key issue because what we're talking about is is a lot more difficult than just um, providing some examples and giving some homework. Um, so some of you also talk about sort of a shift in thinking and um, this growth mindset so that we're actually um, recognizing that um, the reason why we might want to use a variety of assessments as well as the belief that students are capable of being able to engage in some of these rich activities. Quite often there's a mindset that um, 
well, the rich activities and the rich tasks are fine for the kids who are strong in mathematics, but they're not for everybody. And there's tons of evidence that actually shows that um, working on rich tasks with multiple entry points um, provides great success for um, struggling learners because they actually can engage in this and their thinking is valued as opposed to being shown one particular way to do it that doesn't connect with them at all. So I think that that's an important thing. Some of you were talking about the idea that um, that um, sometimes people feel as though, well, the test, uh, I'm going to stick with tests and quizzes because I feel that those I can justify and those are more accurate. And this whole notion of objectivity and subjectivity, where, you know, the design of a test and what questions I actually put on a test is a very subjective choice. It is definitely not objective. And the way I see the students understanding in their written work um, requires me to be able to, to see and to think. So I actually feel that having a conversation with a student and having them explain their thinking, uh, maybe even after they've done some written work, um, will provide me with much stronger evidence that I feel much more comfortable justing, justifying to a parent than what it is that they put on a piece of paper. Um, and some of you also talked in terms of challenges around um, uh, struggling to kind of pay attention to those verbs. and um, I actually find that that verb activity is a pretty important one to do, to have teachers look at what are the verbs in this curriculum I'm doing. Um, because sometimes I hear people say, well, I really can't be doing investigations and I really can't be having kids actually kind of explain their thinking and because I really have to cover the curriculum and there's no time for that. So actually, if we look at the curriculum, that is what the curriculum is suggesting. So by covering the curriculum, we should be having students do those kinds of things. And if we're assessing them, we need to be considering those verbs. Um, so these things take time as well. And I find that as teachers collaborate and work together, it helps to shift that thinking. Some of the challenges you talk about can be easily addressed because it might be finding an appropriate resource, which is easier to do. But some of the other things you talk about as challenges take a little more time because sometimes it's a matter of something that's conceptual where students might not understand the math or they might not understand why we're doing the kinds of things that we're doing in assessment. Um, or sometimes it's what I call cultural. In other words, it's the expectations of parents or the expectations of students or the expectations of other members of a department or of a, of a division within a school that tends to create some of those challenges. So lots of good ideas and lots of challenges out there. That maybe it's helpful that you see that other people have similar challenges and that you recognize that some of these take a while. So now I want to move to large-scale assessment and particularly the interplay between large-scale and um, classroom assessment. And I'll do sort of a quick overview because I think that you know the differences between classroom assessment and large-scale assessment. Um, and we know that um, there's not a lot of feedback. And often with the paper and, paper and pencil assessment, they're dealing with multiple choice and short answer questions. So um, whereas in a classroom, we actually can have a variety of different assessment methods. And that also provides us with the opportunity for detailed feedback to students and for detailed information about the student's thinking. Um, we know that for individual students that results of large-scale assessments are really just one piece of information about a student's performance. And I often use the analogy that they provide a snapshot of what's going on, whereas the classroom teacher has a video recording in their mind as to that student's performance. And we know that um, for schools and boards that we sort of have to be careful as to how we interpret EQAO results and we need to consider other important contextual information um, and comparing from school to school or board to board we know is fairly limited and it was never the intention of EQAO to use EQAO to compare. And so just cautioning about how we use these kinds of um, comparisons and how we use results from EQAO as well as that reminder that EQAO is only assessing part of the curriculum. And in fact, that part of the curriculum that is the easiest um, to be able to assess with paper and pencil. 
we also notice that there might be differences in terms of EQAO uh, compared to classroom assessment. Um, it could be test anxiety, it could be a different kind of wording, or the content is not as familiar to the students, um, or appears in a different format, or the assessment might be because it only has a limited number of items, and it might be actually focusing on some of those items that were not addressed um, to that great extent. And so um, it's really hard to be able to take those results on an individual student basis and make some assumptions about what it is they know and what it is they can do. That we need to consider that with other data as well. Um, I was just reading an article where they talked about the idea um, of thinking about assessment data as a barometer rather than a thermometer. So with therm thermometer, we look at to see what is the exact temperature out there. And we see that as somewhat of a precision as to a measure of the current state. But if we think about assessment data more as a barometer, so we're kind of, hmm, I think I know what's coming. I see this as a bit of a trend. Then I think that might be a better way for us to think about assessment data. There is no way that any assessment data can tell us exactly what a student's achievement is at a particular moment in time. What is it exactly that, um, that that student understands. Um, we really just get these glimpses that we put together. And a lot of you have talked about triangulation of data. That is why we focus on a triangulation of data so that we have multiple sources to be able to think about it. But I think it's helpful to just think about that as a barometer rather than an exact measure in terms of what it is that student knows and can do. In terms of the interplay of large scale and classroom assessment, there's one study that um, that was done that I just wanted to share the results with you. Um, it's a study that was done looking at large scale assessment data and comparing the, um, and this was actually, it was in the US, but I still think it's relevant. It's comparing the data on NAEP, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, I think it is. Um, so it's across the US, um, students take this assessment and much like how we use EQAO, there's a questionnaire that goes along with it so that the students report on the different things that are happening within their classroom and how they feel about math and um, as well as the teachers fill out the questionnaire. So it's taking some of the questionnaire data about teachers assessment practices in the classroom as well as the student achievement data. And it's looking at what is the correlation between the methods that the teachers use in their classroom for assessment and students' achievement on this large-scale assessment, which is mostly multiple choice. And in very interesting data, it shows a correlation, not a cause and effect. But if you look at this graph, you can see that that top um, part of the graph, where the scores are the highest in terms of student achievement, that bar actually represents the scores of students in classrooms where teachers used a variety of assessment types where teachers never or hardly ever used multiple choice assessment. And if we look at the bar that's at the bottom, that represents the scores of students in classrooms where teachers used mainly multiple choice for, test, for assessment. They used multiple choice assessments one to two times a week. Now, for many, that's kind of counterintuitive. Many people feel as though, well, if I keep giving them multiple choice tests in the classroom, they'll be better prepared for things like EQAO. When actually, this data doesn't support that. Now, it's not a cause and effect. So this doesn't mean, OK, I'll stop using multiple choice tests, and then my kids will do really well. It could be an indication that where teachers use a variety of assessment types, that actually that also means that they have a richer instructional set of tasks as well. They see mathematics in deeper ways and um, they realize that a multiple choice test wouldn't be able to address those. And it could be that where the teachers are using mainly multiple choice tests, that um, they might see mathematics in a narrower way. The kinds of instructional things they're doing might be very different than the kinds of instructional things people are doing with a variety of assessment types. So as I say, it's not cause and effect, but it definitely doesn't support the idea that the more we use multiple choice tests in classrooms, the better kids will score on, um, 
upon a multiple choice large scale assessment. There's no doubt about it that we need to give kids some practice and some approaches to working on multiple choice uh, questions. But, you know, I also know if we are constantly giving kids multiple choice assessments, think about it. You've done multiple choice assessments. So you solve a problem and you're delighted to see that your answer is in the list of answers that are there. And so you happily circle it and feel as though you got that question right. When we know if you've designed multiple choice assessments, you do the question wrong as well. You do the question making the common mistakes you expect people to make, and then you put that as one of the choices. So in a sense, we're reinforcing to students when we give lots of multiple choice tests um, that they're actually doing it the wrong way because they feel confident that they did it the right way because their answer was there. They kind of walk away feeling as though they know what they're doing when in fact they don't and they're not getting the feedback. We're not having any window into their thinking. And so I feel that this data tends to caution us a bit um, about how we use multiple choice tests in terms of classroom assessment. And I think that this might be important data to share um, with teachers so that um, we kind of get rid of that misconception that um, the more we practice multiple choice tests, the better prepared they'll be for EQAO. So kind of winding down to our last few minutes, supporting sound assessment practices. Um, I'll, I'll give you a moment to just chat in. What are some of the things that you have done to support or what are your suggestions to support enhancing assessment in mathematics? So if you're an instructional leader, it could be things you've done within your school. If you're a department head, it could be, again, things you might have done with your department. It could be um, things that you've experienced if you're a teacher that have helped to support your um, understanding and development of assessment. Wow, that's good ideas. I'll let you keep going. Lots of work going on out there. That's terrific.
and that's a great idea. So give me another minute or so to type in what we've done. Or what you've done. Sorry. Lots of people addressing uh, things like math content knowledge with having staff work on math. Um, lots of discussions about um, co-assessing and collaborative work. Um, discussions about what you might do in a professional learning community. Some talked about book study, um, like using the five practices book, or analyzing student work together. Some of you talked about the continuum, so thinking about the continuum that students across the curriculum. as well as addressing that, those cultural kinds of issues like talking to parents about assessment. It's so funny, we often don't think about that, um, but it is difficult for parents. Uh, sometimes I find parents actually are quite responsive to the idea that you're gathering multiple sources and actually having conversations with kids to find out what they know. It just seems so much more respectful of their, their children. Another couple going on. And some of you mentioned a Stanford math course that um, I guess that's the Joe Bowler course that people can take, um, which gives people a better idea around uh, mathematical ideas and growth mindsets and things like that. And U Cubed is actually her website, so it's a good thing to go to. Okay, a couple more things. As well, it sounds like people have worked with their teachers around what to do with the data that they gather. So how to put that together, um, how to triangulate. It is tricky. Some of you talked about um, working with people are, in terms of that putting that data together, moving away from number crunching as well. Another minute or so. We've all got some great ideas. Great. Yeah. So, so a lot of you, by the way, this um, this whole presentation is recorded. So you could go back and view it later and you actually could. So a lot of these good ideas, they feel like there are fleeting moments, um, but you can go back and review some of these ideas that people have come up with. And often somebody's name is linked with it. So you might be able to kind of track down and get more information from some people in terms of, so what are they doing around this or that so that you can um, follow through in terms of uh, creating a community and getting some answers. Okay, I see we're nearing 11, so let me just kind of say a couple more things. And as I say, you've got lots of great ideas. So <laughs> I have mine, but your, your list is much longer. So what are some activities of, we know, professional learning communities that support sound assessment? So sharing assessment strategies and ideas. And sometimes I find sharing dilemmas and challenges is helpful too, because then sometimes teachers have ways of of helping one another with some of the challenges that they feel they have. Um, focus on maybe having teachers develop one or two new practices to enhance their assessment. In a minute, I'll share a quote with you um, around um, if we overwhelm them, it's not, not such a great idea. Um, bringing together, as many of you suggested, student samples of work, hard copy, video, um, some of the stuff from Explain Everything that students might have worked on to talk about uh, student thinking, next steps, or to work on how might I give descriptive feedback. It's often hard um, to learn to do descriptive feedback, so working with teachers to do that. Um, and considering the assessment strategies, many of you mentioned this actually, was the alignment of instruction and curriculum. So considering those similar to what we did today by looking at tasks in terms of 
how does the assessment align with the instruction? And thinking about how do we involve students in the assessment process? I, I think that that's kind of a hard thing to do. And sometimes um, it's hard for people to see how that actually should happen. So thinking about ways that teachers can share that. So in a study by uh, Marinowski, who is a Canadian researcher, she, um, she talked about a study where she had a professional learning community with secondary teachers, and they were developing their expertise in formative assessment and self-assessment and groups working on whiteboards and fear, pe sorry, peer feedback. And um, in, in the chapter that she wrote, she, um, she leaned on uh, Dylan William, who said that, uh, you can see it in quotes there, when teachers try to change more than two or three things about their teaching at the same time, the typical result is that their teaching deteriorates and they go back to doing what they were doing before. So um, the idea is that uh, I think it's important for teachers to think about one or two things, two or three things that they're going to work on over a particular term, semester, or year, and to focus on those as opposed to kind of trying to overhaul everything. And um, gradually over time, then they can make other adjustments to their teaching. So just a reminder, assessment shows students what's valued. And it really determines to a great extent what learners perceive to be valid knowledge. And I think that that's something that's important that we need to kind of keep out there. Um, and when we consider an assessment, we need to consider what is this showing students that's valued? And what is it that teachers are paying attention to? Because they should be paying attention to those things that are actually most important to improve student learning. So at the end of this, um, I have a list of references. So if you need to, you, uh, any of those that I used, you, you could go to. Um, I'm not going to talk through them. They're just there so that when you, if you download the PowerPoint, then you're able to get them. And um, I'll just thank you. And um, I believe you're going to be able to download the uh, 